I open this um, audience, the questions to the audience. I would like to pose some questions. First and most important questions, why are you both wearing black tops? <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if any of you ever um, have listened to Johnny Cash. Um, country and Western um, singer. And he played a, um, he, used to, he always wore black. And he was playing at Folsom Prison. And someone said, so, you know, <laughs> you're not in prison. Why do you wear black? And he said, well, I am going to wear black until there is justice, until there is honesty, until there is um, compassion in our world. And he said, so that's why I wear black. It's my symbol of my quest. So I'm not sure if that's why Jeff and I are wearing black, but you know, it's a good story. It's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely the best answer to that question. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> But let's get serious. Um, I get so many questions about Scrum Alliance, Scrum.org. Should I certify for Scrum Alliance, certified Scrum Master? Should I go for Scrum.org, certified whatever? Um, could you bring us some light into these organizations and what your thoughts about this? Absolutely. I found it's Agile Alliance. I found it's Scrum Alliance. I founded Scrum.org. Jeff founded Scrum Inc. Jeff founded Scrum Foundation. Um, all of them are great sources, because we built them, yeah. right? right. Of, of expertise of Scrum, knowledge of Scrum. Matter of fact, there are a lot of other organizations, including yours, right? Um, I was talking to a guy in development once, and um, he was yelling at me because he had hired a certified scrum master and the guy was a dolt, kind of like a word like idiot. And I said, oh, and he said, so, so, you know, I think you guys did a lousy job. I said, did you interview this person? <laughs> so many sources of excellence as well as many sources of truly terrible support products and capabilities. I thoroughly advise you to investigate before you engage, okay? Yeah, because I, we're all trying to do the same thing, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, in our interest, Scrum is beyond any organization. These organizations are just uh, mechanisms for trying to bring Scrum to the world. Uh, often there's competition between them over money, which has nothing to do with what Scrum is about. Uh, our interest from the beginning is to been ma make Scrum open and free, and our major interest is in keeping that, keeping it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And so even though I still do work with Scrum Alliance, ken.scrum.org, I work together closely with Scrum. Um, there sh people should ha have whatever certification they want. Uh, you know, when I teach a Scrum class, I tell people, go to Ken's site, take the test. You get certified by him. Uh, you know, I can get you the certified Scrum Alliance thing as well whatever you want. The main thing is that you learn how to do Scrum well and you, you build great teams. That's, that's, that's what we're all about. And that comes from experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but Jeff and I have put, um, formed something called the Scrum Guide and Jeff now has a Scrum Handbook because as we see the spreading, um, what we're trying to do is avoid what happened in the OO times, object-oriented times, where there were so many varieties and opinions. So we said, to us, the issue is not Scrum. I mean, it's really small, it's simple, so we laid down the definition. It's how you use it that's the issue. So what we've tried to do is avoid the, you know, this being a methodology issue rather than a, you know, earnestness, seriousness, um, effort issue. Who knows, you know, it's a big world. We do the best we can. So if a human resource manager asking me for education, we would answer just doesn't care. You know, it, it just, uh, uh, <clears throat> good teachers matter. You know, people try to get into good universities and they try to get trained by the best instructors. That will never change. 
And the best way of doing that is either looking for references or talking to your friends. Right? I think I have a next interesting question. You said Scrum is a tool, a tool to getting more agile. There are more tools out there. Kanban is increasing. So what is your answer between Scrum and Kanban? What is your thoughts about this? Well, Kanban is a, is a very simple implementation of a Japanese practice. It only has one constraint, minimizing work in progress, which is a really good thing, and I recommend every Scrum team do it. Um, the, the thing that makes Scrum work is that it's based on uh, putting together teams and getting them working well together with the first principle of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, you can implement a Scrum, a Kanban team that will do that, and it's particularly good for continuous flow. But what I do is always wrap Scrum around it. You know, I, I want a product backlog that's prioritized right. I want retrospectives. I want te cross-functional teams working together. That is the only way you get high performance. And uh, if you look at, as Kanban teams get better, I've, I've challenged David Anderson to show me a high productive Kanban team yet because it's going to be it's going to be very difficult. It's going to have to be very Scrum-like. I did write a paper <coughs> on uh, a company called Patient Keeper who had one of the most highest performing Scrums I'd ever seen. And that paper was entitled The Future of Scrum. And we called it a Type C Scrum. And the Scrum community had a, uh, a bit of a hysterical reaction to that paper and said, you know, that's not really Teacher. Scrum at all. And even Ken said, I don't know what it is, but it's a competitive monster. It eats the competition for lunch. But it was structured in a way that is beyond the current conception of Kanban, but it had a, a Kanban approach. Uh, we, were, it was like, we were doing things like parallel pipelining on, uh, uh, on, a, on a microchip, you know, multi-threading sprints through teams. And that completely baffled people. But doing that allowed us to go to production in large enterprises, big hospital systems, at the end of every sprint. And so at whatever we sprint we needed to bring hospitals into production, whether it was a one week, a two week, three week, or four week, never more than that, we had those sprints running. And we would launch multiple sprints simultaneously. We always had four to six sprints running concurrently through a set of stable teams. And uh, that was a very difficult implementation to sustain once the, once the people that implemented that left. But I've yet to see, uh, I know there are, there are a number of companies now in the world that are actually able to do releases, you know, at the end of every sprint. There are some people that even do daily releases now. But to uh, do what we did, which let's bring up the four biggest hospitals in Zurich at the end of the next sprint, we could do that. I haven't seen another company being able to manifest that. People would call that a very Kanban-like scrum. And I've told the Kanban people, you know, when you get really high-performing Kanban teams, it'll look very similar to Patient Keeper. What, what Jeff um, forgot to mention is he spent six years getting Patient Keeper to that state. I spent two years with him. It, it is a um, manifestation of engineering excellence. And my concern when people talk about Kanban is that they often do it because Scrum's hard and Kanban's easy. And what they then miss is the work that they have to go through to gain the engineering excellence that you were able to achieve. Um, if you look through um, the documents on process control, Kanban is, is meant for complicated work. That is, we have things that we pretty much know, so we can have actually swim lanes, and we can look at the steady flow of things coming in, and let's measure it and optimize it. But by and large, we know what's happening, we're just trying to optimize. Scrum is aimed at complex work where the number of things you don't know overwhelms the things you do know. And so I would suggest that you uh, 
Um, well, everyone needs to make a living. So there's Kanban. <laughs> Before I open up to the audience, I have a last question. We have now 15 years Scrum, and Scrum is still Scrum. What will be in another 15 years? Ken. Oh, my God. Um, so our world's becoming more complex. Our products are more complex. The need for creative teams coming up with sophisticated, high-quality products is growing. Um, I think whether it's called Scrum, Scribble, Nuts, Warts, um, an approach which improves our ability to do this is needed. Um, I would hope, I had hoped that by 2015, 2016, the whole terminology around Scrum would have disappeared because it would have been inherent in the way we work. Um, the terminology is very useful because it causes an e ease of talking amongst people. The framework is very useful because it points out the problems. My fear is that it proves too hard for us. And we don't rise to the challenge, and Scrum disappears as a cloud of fads. Uh, my hope is that this continues for a long time, and it's part of us um, rising to the occasion, because we certainly aren't short on problems. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing that, uh, in my view, that has made Scrum successful is that it's about people. And it's built on it, it, uh, what builds great sports teams. It pulls passion from the people. Yeah. Uh, it pulls, honestly, it pulls people being able to count on one another. People, people being to be willing to watch each other's back. And when someone falls, they will protect that person and pick them up. No matter what we call it, 15 years from now, that will be part of whatever makes great teams. And to the extent that we can keep that part of what we call, now call Scrum, uh, Scrum will continue to exist. And we have those beliefs about people, work. These are you know, very great <coughs> values, and I think they're, you, know, you see them across history. The neat thing is, We've proven now that if you do it, it pays for itself. You know, so businesses which are hard-nosed, tough places, it turns out that if you let the people do creative work and work <coughs> together and cover each back, um, you can outcompete the others that don't. And you know, so that's neat. Yeah, I mean, I remember. Uh, 15 and 20 years, this is before Scrum, I was, I was doing startups and I would meet with the VCs and I would tell them, you know, my way, my way of thinking about how things should be done. And they would say, you know, you're a flower child. You're, you're some kind of hippie from California. You this will never work. You can't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> but now they come to me and they want to hire me as an advisor. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're going to do what we <laughs> advise them, but. <laughs> but they know it works, even though they have a hard time doing it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there are many questions out there in the audience. We would prefer that you constrain them to ones we know the answers to. Grigorian, <laughs> Unisys, <laughs> Software Development. Um, I really appreciate your talks, thank you very much, but I don't like if you, if we call Scrum is a tool. I think Scrum what? is much every more, it is a says, framework. Every it's time someone says, but, I get worried. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you always spot that, you know, yeah, like, yeah. it's a setup? <laughs> so Scrum is a framework. Uh, my question is, are there any plans to generate return of investment or generate some money with Scrum? with this framework? To who? To, gener to generate some money or to make some financial... Jeff or myself? You know, we're going to form a company and it'll be called Megalith Incorporated and we'll <laughs> treat our employees like shit, but we'll make money off it? No. <laughs> Not for you, but for the Scrum Alliance or some Scrum organization. We leave well, it to you. Yeah, I mean, Scrum is about, you know, in the business world, it's about making 
company, making money for companies. I mean, the company I mentioned that had the Type C Scrum, their revenue went up 400% in one year. That's what a really good Scrum will do for you. So there's plenty of money to be made from Scrum. When we started, though, promoting it to the world, I wanted it to be open. And, uh, it, you know, it was before open source. We, we didn't call it open source. But basically, Scrum is open source. That's the way we want it. And so it's free for everybody to use uh, uh, to make as much money as they can. Our greatest regret, and we've been seeing it <laughs> okay. some, is, is where people are starting to try to copyright or trademark parts of it. And, and that's almost counterintuitive to the idea of this being common sense yeah. and something we gave to everyone. Right. Yeah, thank you. And do you think that wait, wait, you wait, reached you only, the finish you of time? I got one question. I, 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 yeah, I, I do want to make a pitch, though. I'm looking for somebody to donate at least $10 million to the Harvard Business School to form a Scrum Institute. And if there's anybody out there in your company that's ready to do that, we'd like to talk to them. Uh, and <laughs> and wait, wait a second, Jeff, can I get a emeritus professorship there? Well, on that money? Well, maybe we'll have a scrum chair. They'll have to establish a scrum chair. At the I don't have to stay in Boston, though, do I? <laughs> 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 this, this sounds really good. <laughs> and 20 million, both of us. <laughs> and my last question, do you think that you reached the definition of TAN for scrum? Or no, we, talked, we told you that already. You were listening, right? Yes. Good, we said no. Do you have any experience in introducing Scrum, for example, into organizations uh, reaching CMMI level three and above? Yes, I've spent, maybe Ken has also, but I have spent, since 2006, I've worked with a CMMI maturity level five organization who uh, has the best data, I think, in the world on Scrum. Uh, what they found, uh, to get to CMMI level five takes, in their view, at least seven years. And uh, they did it in the, the late 90s into 2005. I think they were finally appraised at level five. They then decided that they needed to lean out the corporation because the, uh, the overhead that they introduced they thought was excessive, reporting, bureaucracy. Uh, and they decided that they would use Scrum as a tool to introduce lean. One of the things that people may not realize is Scrum is probably the best tool on the planet for introducing lean into your company. Uh, we have, uh, P I know in auto parts companies in Germany, they've told us, you know, our, our Lean Six Sigma team has, has introduced more Lean and Scrum with, with Scrum in six months than we were able to do for in three years without Scrum. Yeah, Scrum throws waste up in the air. It makes it yeah. so Lean people And it gets everybody involved. So yep. in any event, once they introduced Scrum, they did pilot project for six months, and they found that every project on the average cost half as much and had 40% fewer bugs, plus or minus 3%, and cut their process overhead for managing process by more than 50%. And they immediately started bidding, they do these big fixed price projects in defense and, and elsewhere, 10 million for the euro for the, for the waterfall version, 5 million euro for the scrum version. And, and, and these, at, at CMI5, you need to be able to do a perfect waterfall almost every time. So they're taking the waterfall guys and put them on the scrum teams, changing them back and forth. If they're on scrum teams, it costs half as much. And there's, the, there's the waste yeah. that's showing the waste. You have to remember that, I mean, we get the question that hasn't come up yet, but it's tightly related to the CMI one, is how do you guys feel about PMI and Prince2 Agile? You gotta remember um, the goal of, of Software Engineering Institute was to improve our profession. We're all for that. Yeah. Just our, our technique is scrum. And you look at their, what used to call, be called key process areas, you can do those either in an agile way or in a heavy documentation way. Either one are ways of showing excellence. Mm -hmm. We welcome PMI agile. I mean, this is them recognizing value in something, and they're certainly going to do their approach at it. This is not a competitive methodological war. We're actually trying to do something. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? <laughs> Could you imagine? Good afternoon. I, I really enjoyed the, your, uh, this intervention here. Um, I don't know if you remember, Jeff, uh, I think it was in 2008 in Frankfurt, I took a Scrum Master 
uh, class with uh, with you, um, and you um, you talked about the uh, money for nothing and change for free uh, concept in the context of firm fixed price contracts. Right. Which for me was a was a bit the missing link that uh, had troubled me because I had worked with the European Space Agency for so many years and. And then they're using a, a MIL 2167A implementation, which is the you know the, the origin of waterfalls. And um, we've made some progress in the last three years in in, in implementing, in parts, uh, those uh, these, these options that you were you were yeah. mentioning. And and myself in in a, in a project with uh, automotive industry actually did successfully uh, implement those things. So good. So I so I'm you know I find it, oh. I find it uh, really really interesting and. Maybe you want to yeah. uh, share share the the ideas a little bit. Um, well, you know, whenever I talk to the CEO or senior management of a company that's working in software, for example, uh, I I work with the CIO of O2 in Germany, a big telecom company, and he, you know, one of the first things he said to me is, Jeff, here's my problem. I just finished a hundred million dollar pro a hundred million euro project. It cost me two hundred seventy million euro, and it was two years late. Can Scrum fix that? And I said, well, you must have had to pay for changes. That's why you had the cost overrun, right? The requirements changed, and you had to pay time and materials. <coughs> and the vendor came in initially and lowballed the price, yep. knowing that all their money was going to be made in cost and materials when you made changes. The change orders. And so their incentive was to make that project go on as long as possible and have you pay as much as possible. And he said, that's right. And I said, I was at the Pentagon two weeks ago, Ken. We haven't talked about this. But the Department of Defense of the United States has been instructed by Congress to implement iterative and incremental development. So one of the first things that happened is the head of IT for the DOD, who has been to my scrum course, said, Jeff, you need to come in and talk to the task force right away. So I come in and I, I tell them the same thing. You know, those Beltway bandits in Washington, they come in with a lowball bill in the contract. You sign it. Time and materials. They're going to charge you until they can bleed you dry. And every person in the room said, yes, that's what they do. And I said, well, you need to start putting a short option clause in your contract that says all change is free if the new request, which Scrum can absorb immediately, is offset by throwing away some low-value feature of equal work. Right. And there's always low-value, useless features that can be thrown away. We know on the average, all over the world, 65% of features are uh, never are really used. And so there's huge amounts of waste in software projects. So for the CIO of O2, if he had that in his contract, he would have come in at 100 million euro instead of 270 million euro. It's a simple, low risk way of changing the incentive structure in the industry, which is designed for projects to be late and for budgets to be high. We had. Um a number of companies that have worked with, you know, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Corporation, um, Essex Corporation, Gestalt Corporation, do DOD contracting. And bottom up, the colonels and captains in the Department of Defense have been using Scrum for a number of years. And they just, you know, come up to you and say, wink, wink, nod, we're going to use Scrum. What happened is the programs that would make um, defense um, projects like new. AWACS projects, new over-the-hill radar projects, typically those are vast overruns and fail. And so the idea, if you're a colonel or captain, is if you're assigned one of those programs and you can politically survive its failure, we might promote you to be an admiral or a general. And what started happening is these guys were, you, it came out of APL Johns Hopkins where they first were prototyping using Scrum. And um, what started happening is they started saving lives. I mean, the United States is in lots of wars, and a number of things they'd bring in were saving lives. And it would come right back to the colonel or captain with the credit, and the guy would be promoted based on the success in helping our forces. 
And so now it's, it's, you know, not that all the colonels and captains in the world don't want to be generals and admirals, but they're fighting hand over fist to use Scrum with their projects. There's a very interesting item that came out in the press about the Iraqi war that was essentially turned around by cross-functional teams that put together all the intelligence services and daily meetings, co-location, and they were so fast at, at finding, identifying, and knocking out the bad guys that it put the whole terrorist infrastructure into disarray. And it dropped the violence by over 80% in less than a year and allowed the U.S. to then extract itself pretty much from Iraq. Are, the, I, 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 what's that? The next part is interesting. See, he, this is what happens when the, le when the leadership goes away, when General Petraeus goes yep. away, all the intelligence services have their own agenda. They said, this information sharing is against our self-interest. We have our own agendas. We're going to stop these cross-functional teams. So the bureaucracy has taken down all the cross-functional teams no. in Iraq. Whether they have them in Afghanistan now or not, I don't know. But if they don't have them, we're going to have a disaster in Afghanistan. So Scrum is much bigger than just getting some software done. Another company that we've worked with and is one of our huge success stories, um, I'm not going to disclose its name because of what, I, what I'm going to tell you, but it, it is our, our leading um, example of agility and empowerment of the organization. Um, for instance, in the Chinese earthquake, its local office went in and helped all the people in that area of China and spent $15 million of the corporate money helping them rebuild without permission you know, from the United States. And when they found out about it, no one was punished. This is a good thing. And now if you want to buy equipment in that part of China, it's going to be theirs. And a consultant I know that, that was working with the CEO of that company and working next told me that the top vice presidents there can't wait for the CEO to leave. They are sick of this collaboration and cooperation stuff. They want to reaffirm their right. fiefdoms, their power. You know, they're sick of this stuff. So um, the top guy leaves, and this is why we're, Jeff and I are talking to, with you about culture change. You know, this is not just a you know, top guy forcing it. This is a different way of thinking. Yeah. And that's why I don't think we're going to be retiring for six yeah, months or seven and years. And, you know, it's all about whether you're for the best for people or where you have a self-serving interest where you're feeding at the trough. That's what's going on in the world. There are people that want the best for people, and there are people who want to take everything for themselves. And what happens is Scrum <coughs> makes that visible. Yep. And so then you have a battle. Yeah, we've implemented Scrum like seven times at Fidelity Investments. Whenever they have a problem, severe problem, they bring in Scrum and use it to solve it. But everyone in Fidelity is paid more than almost anyone else in the Northeast of the United States. So they do not want to leave Fidelity. So um, politics is rife, and Scrum is transparent anti-politics. So as, as an organizational idea, it never happened. Yeah. But it's a great problem solver for them. You know, I, I met a VP from Fidelity on an airplane recently, yep. and he said, I'm implementing Scrum. <laughs> and I said, it. well, I heard you've already implemented it in seven other locations. <laughs> and he says to me, it doesn't matter how many times we've implemented and failed. He says, the problem is always the same, and Scrum is always the answer. <laughs> So bear with us if Jeff and I sound occasionally a little cynical. <laughs> All right, that, that last uh, story begs a follow-up question then. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, if every time Fidelity re-implements re Scrum and brings you in, you also benefit from it, no? <laughs> um, the question really is, and I think it's relevant for a number of us in this room, is how to bring Scrum to enterprise and make it stick? I mean, yes, I know your book, and, and there are very no, many. No, the book sucks. 
The book sucks? Yeah. yeah. It's a and good, here I am telling people to read it. It's Why a, does it it's suck? A, it's a good first attempt. Sure. We, Jeff and I have been engaging with, you know, like the Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. and what we're picking up is this is a cultural organizational change. Agree. And um, Rainier, you have um, copies of the path book, to, yeah, where we've engaged and started working with um, cultural change experts, and they've helped us lay out how this would work. Now, the cultural change immediately tests the company because. Um, if they aren't dead serious, they will immediately not do it. And, and it's laid out that way. And this comes from, I mean, Jeff now works more with companies that are going to succeed, but I get calls saying, hey, help us with training. And I'll say, okay, so this is the way we're going to do it. And he said, no, no, I just want my people to talk the same words. Okay, that's not cultural change. And, and I think what we're going to find is um, that this is not going to be a one or two year project anymore. It's going to be an organizationally led thing to be competitive with agility by treating their people differently. And um, the corporations that engage in this won't lose it because that's who they all will become. Our problem right now with like the CEO I had in Petraeus is that's a veneer above a mess. Better to work there while it's a veneer, but it can disappear. You know, the reason that I'm still running around the world doing this <laughs> is that I view uh, Scrum or whatever Scrum's become is really a training ground for people to learn how to be free, how to be empowered, how to be open and transparent and help one another out. That's what we need in the world. And. Uh, You know, this started, so, uh, part of the background of early Scrum, which I didn't have to get a chance to talk about, was my work with microenterprise lending. Because of my work in startups and uh, with the Creative Initiative Foundation, which Ken and I both were involved in years ago, uh, a group called Axion, the largest microenterprise development company in the Western Hemisphere, based on uh, Nobel laureate, uh, uh, what's his name, Yunus in Bangladesh? I can't pronounce it. Uh, his work in the Grameen Bank. And the president asked me to be on the advisory council. And so I spent a year or two watching how they went and worked with the poorest people, uh, mainly in that, for that organization, mainly in, mainly in Central and South America, people who couldn't even feed their children. And they would get them together in a small group and they would say, uh, uh, you know, we can help you come up with a, a small business plan. And when, when, when the group, each person has their own business plan, then we're going to give you $25. And then you can go out and execute that business plan. The $25 will be a loan, and then when you pay back that loan, then we'll give you, you more money. And working that small team and coaching them, they'd find that in, a, in less than a year, all of a sudden, they could feed their children. They not only could feed their children, they could buy clothes for the children. Once they could buy clothes for the children, the children could go to school and become educated. When they got them into school, all of a sudden they were now where they're building a, a new house. Maybe it was just a little shack, but it was, it was a new house for them. And all this time I'm going into work in software development and I'm realizing, you know, these software developers, they're, they're, they're not poor in money because they're making reasonable money, but they're poor in spirit. They're constantly being told they're not good enough. They're constantly being told they're late. They're constantly being told their software sucks. And so I, I said, you know, is there a way to, to bootstrap a team just like we do with the poor people in South America so that they can actually rise up out of oppression and be free? And that was the, 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 the emotional motivation for starting Scrum. And it worked. And that actually goes to something you and I have both seen in organizations where we're talking to the developers and we're talking about self-organizing teams and, and what you see in their eyes is fear. Like, we can't get away with this here. If we do this, you know, I'll be nailed. And it's, it's pretty weird. So here we have something radically different, <laughs> which gives 
corporations and organizations more profitability and competitive advantage. Yet it doesn't allow the management to act in autocratic um, bullying ways. What a conundrum that is. Hmm. I have to give up my way of acting to gain all this competitive advantage. Strong incentive. Finally got an incentive. It's good. So can, can you say more about the, uh, your work with involvement with the organizational change management approaches and how that has uh, worked or produced results? Because that's really... Started, be started it nine months ago. Okay. I'm working with um, partners like Zolka um, who have uh, management consulting arms as well as engineering and consulting arms for development. And because it's a, it's a dual thread thing, you're working with the leadership team, not just the senior management, but the most influential people in the company, and they're driving change, which is leadership, and then the managers manage the change. But it includes things like, um, first of all, making sure you broadly communicate what this is about. Mm -hmm. Keep the communication going to stop rumors from occurring making sure everyone has a vision of what's going to happen and knows or has a way of asking what this means to them and their families as this occurs. Um, things like making sure we change all of the policies, procedures, techniques, all that within the company which support the old way of thinking, manufacturing, and support instead creativity and, and empowerment. So it's, it's a pretty significant um, effort. We'll see how it goes. So aside from uh, the work of John Carter, which is very much in, in, that, in that area of, of thinking and, and his eight steps, any, any other tips from your nine months of engagement in this area? Yeah, for a quick read on mm -hmm. um, what it's like to create change and all the aspects of it, 45-minute um, read, buy the book, Our Iceberg is Melting yeah, by John, John Carter. Carter. Yeah. It's, it's a little fable about a penguin in a colony on iceberg who discovers it's melting. And guess what the other penguins don't want to know? And so it's all the thinking and plotting and strategizing except from a penguin's point of view. And it's because of, it's a story, it's not offensive, it's easy to read, and it doesn't um, scare people of you know, abstract theory. So you're saying if you have a management commitment and from the bottom commitment, you can implement Scrum. Is there any way of getting in guerrilla way from the bottom and not having the acceptance from management, for instance? Or do you think you just have really bad odds there? I was at Swiss Re a while ago, and they're using Scrum pretty well, and they were asking, how do we sell this to management? And my advice was, don't let anyone know you're doing this. <laughs> Because the moment, if it happens prematurely, they're going to come down and want to control it and manage it and everything. But if it goes long enough and proves value, then you're not going to be selling anything. It's already sold. So low profile, you know, it's good. Yeah, in the beginning, all the Scrum was Gorilla Scrum. Yep. And, and, and Jeff and I... We're seeing that in Zurich. I mean, Klaus, you were there in this class. We had that guy, Christian. You know, he, had, he was having trouble selling Scrum to management, and you kept on asking us about that. And I said, well, who started Scrum in your organization? He said, I did. Always Who's keeping it going? He said, I am. Oh, it's, it's your idea. You're the one that's causing the trouble. He said, yeah. <laughs> so we said, well, keep at it. <laughs> so, so those who think that <coughs> it's impossible to learn, Jeff and I, both in Vietnam, studied clearly Viet Cong tactics and are implementing them with Scrum. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the black comes from? I'll say, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, Jeff and I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, to the extent that we've been able to, by talking with you, engage you, um, our pleasure. Um, to the extent that we're going to be able to keep working with you and you work with each other, um, this is pretty important. So thank you for being here. Thank you. This is